Hi everybody, this is Gregor for Personas and today I want to do a bit of a different video. I'd like to do a bias guide for you people interested in getting a new computer for audio. Whether it's PC or Mac, that's entirely up to your own preference, but there's a couple of rules that you should follow regardless of your operating system platform. I got the idea for this video from my buddy James who's currently doing just that, trying to build a new audio computer and he asked me what kind of parts to shop for. And for me this is something that's quite natural, I'm a bit of a geek and I like to select computer parts, but I realized that's not the reality for most people. They just want to focus on their craft and make sure that once they get the new machine it's perfectly suited for what they want to do. And quite often the solution for that seems to be to just tick all of the lowest boxes in a PC or Mac configurator. For instance, I'm right here on the apple.com website and you can see that you have a lot of different processor options. You might not know which one the best is for audio right away. So I've seen a lot of people just always tick the lowest box here and yeah, stack that thing up well to over $50,000 or something like that, uh, just because they wanted to make sure that it's good for audio production. Ironically, when they got the machine, they found that they were still not able to do low latency monitoring at low block sizes of their favorite virtual instruments, and they were very frustrated about it. They thought, I spent all this money onto a new computer, why don't I get the benchmarks or the results in my everyday work that I was expecting? That is because they were only ticking the lowest box in their configurator. That's kind of the first mistake to avoid. Don't always tick the lowest box in these configurators. Same goes for uh, Windows computers, of course. Right here, I would have the PC configurator from Digital Audio Networks in Germany. Also there, a lot of people just always go for the lowest option, even though there might be a much better option for what they want to do, uh, which is also much less pricey. And this leads me straight into mistake number two that I see a lot of people make when they try to decide on a new audio computer. They always look only at the core count of the CPU that they're trying to get. Like they see there's a 28 core Intel Xeon here in the Mac Pro configurator that's 7000 bucks more expensive than the 8 core base model that must be better for audio. There's no way that the 28 core isn't better for audio than the 8 core baseline, right? Well, it really depends on what you're trying to do. Are you trying to play back hundreds of tracks of Contact, Vienna Symphonic Orchestra Library or a Spitfire Audio and you can do that at a higher block size, you don't need any low latency monitoring, then yes, core count is king. But if your requirements are entirely different, for example, you want to have very low block sizes for ultra low latency monitoring. You want to have great response when playing a power hungry virtual instrument live. You don't want to feel any delay as you're hitting the keys. That's when you cannot rely on core count. Because one channel of audio or a virtual instrument that you're monitoring can only be processed by one CPU thread at a time. So even if you have 28, 64 cores available, if one of these cores doesn't bring the performance you need, then you don't get any performance benefits. So what I'm saying is that if you want to have the ability to play back a lot of tracks and you want to put your block size as low as possible, like 16, 32 samples, then you need to not only look at the core count, you also need to look at the single core performance and the bass clock, like the bass gigahertz, not just the turbo boost because that can't be sustained for a long period of time of your next CPU. You can also see that here in the benchmarks. I mean, you have a Threadripper at the top of the list when it comes to multi-core scores, absolutely slaughtering everything else. But when you click on it, you see that the single core score is just a fraction of that. And when you compare that to a CPU with just eight cores, then you'll notice that you get much better single core performance, meaning much better low latency monitoring capacities on the much cheaper CPU. So if your goal was to set your block size to like 16 samples and play the Diva or the Yuhi Hive or some of these performance hungry synthesizers or do real time monitoring of auto tune effects, then this much cheaper Intel CPU would totally beat that Threadripper. 
Now, of course, I'm not biased towards Intel in any way, shape or form. I mean, there's fantastic Ryzen processes where you get amazing core counts and great base clocks. All I'm saying is that you shouldn't just look at the amount of cores and assume that's a great CPU for audio. You need to find that sweet spot between great base clock, great single core performance, great thermals so that the CPU fan doesn't have to spin up so much and create all this noise in the studio and core count so that you can play back many tracks without any issues. The third mistake that I see a lot of buyers of a new audio computer make is that they invest too much or too little into their RAM and graphics. Now before we can say how much RAM you should put into your new audio computer, let's first get on the same page why RAM is useful or necessary in a DAW like Studio One. Well, RAM is really important to increase your headroom, meaning that you have more capacity to load multiple plugins at once without any lags or crashes, that you can hit playback on a session with a lot of time stretching and pitch shifting going on. But RAM does not help you when you want to play your virtual instruments at low block sizes. If you want to put low latency mode on, then RAM isn't really all that helpful. And I see that a lot of users generally overestimate the amount of RAM that they need in their system. A great strategy to get a bit of a feel for how much RAM you would need is to open up the activity monitor in macOS or the task manager on Windows and just see what your maximum load of RAM is when you run as many apps or the biggest session that you have. Then just calculate that plus a little bit of headroom and then you're probably pretty close to a very realistic RAM figure. Of course, you shouldn't have too little RAM because that would severely limit your navigation and your playback in the session. But you should also not spend too much on it because chances are that big chunks of it you'll never access. The same issue I see when it comes to picking a graphics card. Here, users often underestimate the graphics card they need because they do an audio, right? That has nothing to do with graphics. Well, but in times where Studio One 5 uses hardware acceleration on Mac, for instance, more and more of the tasks that were traditionally handled by the CPU are now being taken on by the GPU, which leaves more of the CPU capacity for the actual processing of audio. So don't cut corners here. You don't need a high class, top of the line graphics card, but you shouldn't go for integrated graphics either. The fourth mistake that I see time and time again when people purchase an audio computer is that they invest too much or too little into their hard drives. A great example for overspending would be to have an 8 terabyte SSD, which really costs a premium, just for archiving media files and as an external backup. That is a total waste. Any hard drive can take these kind of tasks. But your sample libraries, all the stuff that you need to access as quickly as possible, your song folder, your operating system needs to be on very fast hard drives because especially on the operating system side, that really makes such a huge impact on how quickly your apps start, how quickly your computer boots and so forth. So if you can't afford eight terabytes of SSDs, that's completely fine, but reserve one SSD at least for your operating system. And if at all possible, have another SSD drive for your songs and sample library content. Please don't try to cut any corners here because you might regret that at some point in the future. Also, make sure that you don't just set the capacity of your SSD drive at the lowest minimum, like let's say 500 gigabytes. At least two terabytes would be preferred because you always need a little bit of free space on this drive to yeah, have it working properly at the fastest speed possible. Which leads me straight to the fifth and final mistake to avoid when buying a new audio computer, and that is cutting the wrong corners, especially where it's so yeah, annoying because it could have been easily prevented. Uh, I give you an easy example, a small power supply. Not only does this artificially limit the amount of power draw of all the components, but also it severely restricts you when it comes to upgradability down the line. Because if you calculated everything just at that base power draw level, and then you want to upgrade a component a couple years later, then you also have to always upgrade your power supply. This is a lot more expensive than if you've just gone for the proper power supply in the first place. Same goes with noisy fans. Don't go with a build that's, you know, just 
equipped with the cheapest fans possible after you put in some premium parts. Uh, I mean, it's a studio computer. It shouldn't ruin all of your recordings by having this noisy fan. It's kind of whiny running in the background, right? Also consider the IO that you need. If you have a Thunderbolt interface, then don't start cutting corners at your main board by going for one that doesn't have any Thunderbolt connectivity. Don't save the money at the wrong end. Consider the amount of USB ports that you need and make sure that you choose a motherboard that provides that. Now, if you're somebody who just wants to focus on music and is not too tech savvy, you don't want to build your own audio computer with your own preferred parts, then I highly recommend digital audio networks if you're based in Europe or if you're over in the US. PC Audio Labs. Both companies are specialized in audio PCs and computers that are tested and shipped made to order with great thermals, fantastic low noise performance and just specs that make sense for a digital audio workstation. I'm going to add links to both of these dealers in the video description. I hope that these tips are helpful in your next purchase when you go for a new audio computer, whether it be PC or Mac. These are just, of course, a couple of my own experiences and recommendations. If you have anything you disagree with or that you would like to add, please add it here in the comments below. We love to read your comments and see you next time.